from the center of our galaxy, which is surrounding us with some 200 billion stars. And on out in the universe, there's an estimated 100 billion other galaxies. And each one contains on the order of several hundred billion stars. And sometimes when we look at the stars, some ancient unanswered questions come to mind. What is our human place in the universe? Are we humans alone in the universe? Who are we humans really? And those, I think, are questions that are at the core of the reasons for doing an international mission to Mars on a scientific mission. And I'm talking about sending humans to Mars, not robots. And if we do that on an international basis, it will lift human life to a higher level of authenticity. It will cultivate a global human identity core. It will increase our human self-esteem and confidence. It will share mission costs with other nations, make peace, and reduce military spending. It will encourage science education. It will create jobs and prosperity. It will foster a more mature and wiser human civilization. And it will produce authentic novelty and excitement to inspire all humanity, and I think even more than a Super Bowl football game. <clears throat> Now, Steven Weinberg had something to say about this. He said that the effort to understand the universe is one of the few things that lifts human life a little above the level of farce. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's actually true. We play a lot of games. And this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon also speaks to this matter. Calvin says, look at all the stars. The universe just goes out forever and ever. And then Hobbes says, it kind of makes you wonder why man considers himself such a big screaming deal. And then Calvin says, that's why we stay inside with our appliances. <laughs> and you know, we do that a lot. And even when we go outdoors, in effect, we're still doing it because we have so many human-made lights that now two-thirds of the people in North America cannot see the glow of the Milky Way galaxy. And you could say that we're hiding in our own light, both philosophically and factually speaking. But I think the good thing is some benefits will be immediate when we make the decision to commit ourselves to a Humans to Mars mission on a scientific mission to understand ourselves in the universe. Now how that can be, some of those benefits can be immediate is explained by Nathaniel Brandon. He wrote that the only authentic basis of self-esteem is an unreached determination to use one's mind to the fullest of one's ability and a refusal to ever evade one's knowledge or act against it. Now that's not easily done 
That's tough. But I think it works. And one way to use your mind to the fullest is to use the results of science. And that can be done in three basic ways. One is to predict and influence nature to produce life-enhancing technology such as cell phones, air conditioners, computers, robotic farm machinery, and the list keeps going on and on and getting larger to the point that some of us could not exist, could not survive without it. A second way that we use the results of science is to produce weapons and surveillance mechanisms to be secure from harmful other humans. And I put quotation marks around the word secure because I think in the long run when we build weapons to kill other humans, it doesn't really make us more secure. And also around the word other because I think we have a strong tendency to see other humans who are just a little bit different than we are as somehow threatening. And a third way to use the results of science is to search for human meaning and identity. And this is a way that science began several centuries ago. But we have largely pushed that aside in order to use the first two. But there has been some resurgence recently in using the result of science to search for human meaning. And a pioneer in that resurgence was Kenneth Patton. He wrote a book back in 1964 entitled A Religion for One World. And in that book he wrote, a universal religion for the entire world must be thoroughly naturalistic and scientific. I think he was way ahead of his time. I think he's right on there. But I also, personally, I would not have continued to call it a religion, but he did. He also wrote that science rests on a foundation of scrupulous moral principles, the chief of which is an exacting honesty and objectivity. Now we often, most of us don't think of science as having an ethical element. But if you think about it, and we do science properly, it does. If you're doing science properly, we are being honest and objective and transparent. Now, a more recent example of this resurgence is a book entitled Science and the Quest for Meaning. It's written by Alfred I. Tauber, who is the Boston University professor of philosophy and he also directs our History of Science program. And in that 2009 book, he wrote that the role of science in defining personal identity cannot be overemphasized. In other words, we need to bring back this idea of using science to search for human meaning and emphasize it. Talk about it. Now, Werner von Braun was doing this and as you know, he was a brilliant rocket scientist that designed the Saturn V rocket in 1969 that sent us to the moon. And he said, by going into outer space, we will find ourselves. In other words, by exploring beyond the Earth, we will discover something new about our human identity. Now, what is human identity? Well, obviously, it's made up of many different factors, but some of the major ones are gender, race, ancestral origins, language, nationality, occupation, religion, and our place in the universe. Now what does exploring Mars have to do with human identity? Well, discoveries about Mars would add to our perceptions of our place in the universe. And one of the key questions is, for instance, if we were to, to discover a DNA life form on Mars, that would mean we're probably not alone in the universe, that other life forms have evolved commonly throughout the universe. On the other hand, if we would discover non, um, now I got that backwards, if we discover non-DNA life forms on Mars, that would pro probably mean we're not alone in the universe. On the other hand, if we discovered a DNA life form on Mars, that would mean we're probably related to it, could have descended from it, and in a sense, 
we could even be Martians. <laughs> yeah, we could. Um, and our place in the universe is at the, at the core of our human identity. And our identity, of course, is a powerful influence on our behavior. Uh, we generally behave according to who we think we are and what we think we can do. And a story that kind of illustrates this is the story of Giordano Bruno, who was a 16th century humanist monk who went around in 16th century Europe telling everyone, we humans are not alone in the universe. There are other civilizations out there among the stars. And he also said that the Earth orbits the sun instead of the sun orbiting the Earth. And that radical information of the day threatened the religious identity of the church people of the day. And they arrested him, put him in prison for eight years, and in the year 1600, they burnt him at the stake in Rome, Italy. <clears throat> now, this is 413 years later, and we're still doing atrocious things along those same lines. And an example of that is uh, Pastor Terry Jones, who apparently felt that his religious identity was threatened by the mere existence of a Koran, and he held a public burning of a Koran back in 2011. And immediately after that, on the other side of the world, in Afghanistan, people apparently felt that their religious identity was threatened by that burning of a Koran, and they responded with protests, killings, and suicide bombings. And that same sort of thing is going on and on. Now, Martin Sen, who is from India, wrote a book back in 2006 entitled Identity of Violence. And he kind of summarized this whole thing. And in that book he wrote that many of the conflicts and barbarities in the world are sustained through the illusion of a unique and choiceless identity. And I think the key words there is illusion and choiceless. And he says that that results in homespun elemental violence or globally artful violence and terrorism. And he also writes that the solution to that is to see ourselves as planetary citizens. And in other words, well, he also says that global identity can begin to receive its due without eliminating our other loyalties. In other words, we can see ourselves as planetary citizens but retain our language and our religion and our nationality and all that. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way a world government. I'm merely suggesting that a focused, committed scientific mission to send humans to Mars will help to improve life on Earth. That's all I'm saying here. One project. I made this cartoon here to illustrate the most common response I get when I do this presentation. And I've done it about 30 times. It's two guys talking on the Earth, and the first one says, before we waste money on sending people to Mars, we need to solve problems here on Earth. I've heard this over and over. Second guy says, yeah, we need to wait until we're finished killing each other with trillion dollar wars to prove <laughs> whose God is really God. <laughs> I think we really do that. Jesus, we do. We do. We spend a lot of money killing each other. And there's a narrative going around in some circles that the United States entered Iraq and Afghanistan in order to, to destroy Islam. Well, of course we didn't. That's not true. But when we send weapons like this over there to kill certain people, it increases those perceptions, I believe. And I got this pie chart from the Quaker Friends website that shows that the 2013 discretionary budget is 60% for the United States military, and for space exploration to NASA is this mere 0.6%, this tiny little sliver. Now, way back in 1960, Marshall McLuhan saw all of these communication satellites being launched and interconnecting the entire globe with instantaneous communication. 
and he coined the term Global Village. And shortly after that, the astronaut Edgar Mitchell kind of confirmed what McLuhan was saying. Mitchell said that seeing the Earth from space produced instant global consciousness, and I came back to Earth no longer an American citizen, but a planetary citizen. And several astronauts have reported the same feelings, no matter what country they're from. Now, Jill Tarter, who is an astronomer, and has been involved with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence for much of her career, also has made the statement that we are all earthlings, we owe it to each other to celebrate our commonality rather than our perceived differences, and when I read about what astronomers think, what space exploration enthusiasts think, I often hear the same kind of thing. So it, it's a unifying process, I believe. Now, back in 2008, there was a study that showed that more and more young people are seeing themselves as planetary citizens. But obviously, when we went to the moon back in 1969, it was merely a race between the United States and the Soviets. And when we got there, we planted the United States flag on the moon. But what I'm saying here is, I think it would have been much more beneficial and wiser and diplomatic to have planted the flag of Earth on the moon, just as they are doing here at the South Pole in the Antarctica. Now, the Reverend Dr. Fraser Watts, a Cambridge professor of theology and science, and I think that's a very good combination, uh, wrote back in 2006 that science is the most genuinely international movement in the world order and therefore a force for peace and stability. And keeping in mind that he is a reverend, he said that religion is associated with culture and identity and is a source of tension. And a good example of international cooperation in science is the Large Hadron Collider, supported by 60 different nations, cost $10 billion, and the United States is part of that. It's located near Geneva, Switzerland. And they recently announced that they found the fundamental particle of the universe, the Higgs, or as some of the media has dubbed it, the God particle. And I think this will help all humanity understand how the universe actually works. Now, of course, on the other hand, humans compete in many different ways. There's global competition in products and labor, and has been for some time. <coughs> and there's competition for NASA contracts, including the next shuttle ride up the International Space Station. And who do you think won the contract to manufacture this pin, NASA pin I'm wearing on my lapel? China. Every, everybody knows it was China. Yes, it was made in China. <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, a mission to Mars should not be a competition between nations. And some nations, including the United States, could lead and coordinate an international mission to send humans to Mars on a scientific mission. But if we as the U.S. continue to sit around a country like China or Japan or Brazil or India, will go ahead and do something and go to Mars. Now, Martin A. Nowak had an uh, article in the July 2012 issue of Scientific American. It was entitled, The Evolution of Cooperation. And he wrote in that article that instead of opposing competition, cooperation has operated alongside it from the get-go to shape the evolution of life on Earth. And in other, other words, we can say that we humans are as successful as we are because we have evolved to cooperate as well as compete. Now, John M. Logston uh, wrote a book back in 2010 entitled John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon. And he found that in 1963, Kennedy proposed sending representatives of all countries to the moon with a global approach to space exploration. And he also found that Kennedy asked, why should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? 
And Logson says we've either ignored this or have forgotten about it. And also Kennedy was in the process, Logson said, of negotiating to do this with Khrushchev when he was assassinated. And uh, Logson also said that international cooperation in space exploration is even more the case now in the 21st century. Now, back at the NASA Ames Research Center in 2006, there was a conference made up of mostly younger people. And one of their major conclusions was that international collaboration is not only vital to sending humans to Mars, but should be one of the most important reasons for going in the first place. In other words, if we accomplish nothing else by going to Mars, let's do it as an international scientific project to bring nations together, maybe we can save enough money from doing wars to send some spacecraft up there. And Paul Hill and Robert Caswell, both of the NASA administration, have informed me that they think that probably the only way we'll ever send humans to Mars on a scientific mission is through international cooperation. I was a little surprised they said that, but that's what they told me. Now, there are lots of examples of international cooperation and space exploration now. Some of them are, well, obviously, the Mars Society. Uh, there's International Space Station ha has 16 nations cooperating now, and the Russians are providing transportation for the astronauts up to it. And as you know, the Russians have used to be our mortal enemies. And the Europeans and Japanese are transferring cargo up to the station. And the Chinese recently asked to join, but the United States Congress excluded China, saying they would be a security risk. I think they would be well worth the risk. And in 2012, there was a simulated mission to Mars in Moscow with a crew of Russians, Chinese, Frenchmen, and a Colombian. And the Russians have recently also expressed a desire to have a joint Humans to Mars mission with the United States. And the Curiosity rover that landed last August on Mars has parts from five nations. And the National Space Society uh, recently announced that they are going to do a project for the United States, India, Japan, UK, Russia, and China. They want to produce solar power for all humanity. <clears throat> and the ExoMars project is the project of cooperation between the European Space Agency and the Russians to send up a Mars orbiter and lander in 2016 and 2018. Now, obviously, this is the Curiosity rover. And I did a brief survey last summer, two weeks before it landed, where I approached people at random on the streets and asked them if they knew anything about what was going to happen on the planet Mars. And 47 people out of 50 did not know anything about the Curiosity rover. And that tells me that a humans to Mars would gather much more interest than any robotic mission, even if it weighs a ton. Now, Jeffrey Bennett, who is an astrophysicist and lives right here in Boulder, has written that a little perspective on our place in the universe makes any form of geographic, ethnic, or religious hatred seem just plain ridiculous. And he went on to write that we can grow up and solve our problems only by exploring the universe beyond the Earth. In other words, we're not ever going to become a truly wise and mature human civilization until we explore extensively beyond the Earth. That's the way we're going to grow up. Now, oh, also Bennett sent me an email, and he agrees very much that an international mission to Mars would be a good idea. And an international mission to Mars should invite every nation to participate at whatever level they're capable of. And every continent should be represented by a crew member. And all of the proceedings need to be translated into all the major languages of the world so that everyone feels included. 
we could probably use some of that here at the Mars conference, I've noticed. And it should be the ultimate television news report, a live news report from the crew, perhaps a half an hour a day as they leave the Earth, approach Mars, walk on the surface of Mars, and then return to the Earth. I think such a program would inspire all humanity and everyone that had it, some kind of video screen would be watching it. So in conclusion, an international Humans to Mars mission can improve life on Earth in these ways. Lift human life to a higher level of authenticity, cultivate a global human identity core, increase our human self-esteem, share mission costs with other nations, make peace and reduce military spending, encourage science education, create jobs and prosperity, produce authentic novelty and excitement to inspire all humanity, and in the end, foster a more mature and wiser human civilization. We'll have about uh, five, uh, five minutes for questions. Okay. And I, first question. You have a question? Well, just on the point of uh, encouraging science education, I noticed from some of your sources, I got a, get an idea that it, this would reduce the apparent division between arts and sciences. Oh, and I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I was thinking more on the order of reducing conflict between people with different identities and different cultures. And, well, sure, that's uh, yeah. overarching. That. Yeah. Yes. It would provide children with heroes, science-oriented heroes, the way the moon mission did. Yeah. Sure. I love your presentation. It was a great message. I have, this is just a nitpicky question. Sure. Uh, where did you get your numbers for the uh, national budget pie chart? I got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I got that from the Quaker Friends website. Okay. It's a very complicated process. I don't pretend to uh, understand it completely, but you need to keep in mind that was a dis discretionary budget. I had a lawyer in the audience one time who really didn't like that slide, and he ended up saying, oh, in order for me not to be misleading people, I needed to put the print form of saying it was discretionary because before I just orally said that, but he really got on my case. But anyway, <laughs> it's a sensitive subject and it's probably been cut since I got that information. In other words, the NASA part would be lower. Any more questions? Would it yes. be possible to send every lawyer to Mars? <laughs> 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 No, they would probably argue about how legal it was after they got there or something. I'd actually like to take further exception with that pie chart because, yeah. because what you're saying in that chart is that there is some spending that we have that is not discretionary. And yeah. th that's, well, that, that's just absurd. Every, uh, every single dollar we spend is a choice, every single one, even if it is only to continue doing what we're doing in certain areas on autopilot. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I thought that was a good point to put up there, but it's a very complicated process, and there are people who understand that better, way, way better than I do, but I, I do trust the Quaker Friends. Everybody knows who the Quaker Friends are, right? They're an honest bunch of people. I don't think they would have put it up there if it was misleading, but you're probably right, too. I don't well, I think the government describes the budget as discretionary and non-discretionary spending, so that's probably why it's like that. Okay. Yeah. And yes. it's a false distinction. Military spending is actually down 20%. Yeah, 17 last year. That would be including discretionary and non-discretionary? Yeah, so it's down to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, military, and everything else, each at about one fifth. Part of what I like to bring up when we're talking about that is I think if you took the money we spent in Afghanistan and Iraq, that we'd have enough money to go to Mars. A good project. Actually, I actually have a funny yeah. note about that. I'm sorry? I have a funny note about that. As, a, as a, per Robert Zubrin's $20 billion 10-year um, mission to Mars, if you turn off all the air conditioners in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, you could go to Mars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did it. It was fine. Any other questions before we quit? Tough enough. Yes. Not so much nitpicky, uh, it's kind of a half question, half comment. You mentioned there are three purposes to science. And one thing I wanted to add is, 
it's not, and it's kind of might have fit into your first one, which was basically a master of the natural resources, farming, and improvement of the physical human body is, I think, one. And it's only kind of emerging now. But, you know, like right now we think of prosthetics as something which, you know, you lose an arm, you get a replacement, but it's not quite as good. But there's going to be, there's going definitely going to come a time when, you know, a body shop is in somewhere where you're going to take your car. It's, you know, all right, I want to be stronger, so yes. I'm going to go with a new arm. Or right. I lost my yeah, that's again. definitely part of it. Yeah. And in fact, I think science is going in the direction where instead of growing a beef animal to butcher, we're going to be growing the steak alone without the rest of the animal. Yeah, they're already doing it. Yeah, they both started on it. I guess the time's up. <laughs>